And I think as a streamer in general, whether you're you're male or female, or just online, it's like if you choose to be a streamer, then you're you're choosing to get hate. That's what people. That's how people see it. So it's like, but you know, if you don't want hate, you shouldn't you shouldn't be a streamer. It's basically part of our our job description, and that is one of those things I try to work against. In this episode, John sits down with Emma B, a.k.a. Sweebless. She's a content creator who bridges the gap between technology, gaming, and lifestyle. And she's passionate about entrepreneurship, innovation, and communication. Let's jump into the interview. Emma, welcome to Building the Metaverse. It is awesome to have you here. I think today we are going to have a great discussion that is going to help inform and educate people about a whole dimension of the game industry and the metaverse that is really an untold story for most people, which is the job of being a live streamer and playing games and bringing experiences live to people who are out there on the internet, trying to connect with people, trying to learn about games. It's the original play to earn, I think, and we'll return to play to earn later, but Let's just start there. I, I would love you to just share a little of the story of your journey, first of all. Like, how did you become a streamer? How did you get into it? And is this like, if I if I wanted to just start live streaming, could I go into business doing that, like, tomorrow, if I, if I wanted to do that? Like, I'm curious Absolutely. about all that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so tell, tell us the journey. Um, every journey is different, but yeah, uh, my journey is uh, was a bit strange because the first uh, first time I saw Twitch, that was like nine years ago now, and uh, I didn't at all understand. I mean, I hadn't even seen uh, YouTube or, or let's uh, let's play on YouTube, only like cat videos and you know the things that you see going around Facebook. Um, so uh, when I saw Twitch the first time, it was actually a developer who showed me Twitch, and that was the uh, developer Minecraft Notch. And mm -hmm. um, I asked what he was doing, and he said he was watching a speedrun. And I'm like, what is a speedrun? And he showed me a, a link to Twitch, where I saw this guy sitting, being like, uh, yeah, playing games. And um, I mean, my first reaction was like, what, you're just you're playing the game, but you're not actually... Are you playing with him? You're just... No, no. Uh, are you going to play with him? You're waiting to play? No. He was just watching, and... Uh, I thought it was kind of weird in the beginning, but then I watched, <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> like, yeah, but I, I was like, I did not like, I'm like, that's so strange. But then I got totally just engulfed in, in Twitch and I started watching it and I just, I like got it. I mean, it's kind of like watching, oh, you can compare it to watching any sports, right? Like football or whatever, um, only it's digital, right? So I think, uh, I started doing that and then six months later I finally took the jump and started playing and the reason why I did it was not to become like a famous uh, streamer or, or making money out of streaming actually I didn't even know you could do that at the time um, I, I just wanted to play with people pretty much uh, anyone except my dad because <laughs> nothing wrong with my dad but he was the only person I knew that played games and I got to play with him and but not my colleagues that didn't like games so I was like wow amazing this big community for like gamers that that like the same thing I do and um, and you know like just being able to play multiplayer games with people <laughs> not just running around in a big world uh, uh, so yeah uh, that was the main reason actually that got me started just just the games and uh, the community and, and so probably the big yeah, how long did it take you before it went from, you know, the beginning to like you could really earn the equivalent of a of a reasonable living from doing it? Oh wow! Yeah, right uh, yeah, well, when I started streaming, the the was very so it was a very different the hmm. it was a very different space than it is right now, and way less streamers. Also. Mm -hmm. I think I did have a perk. Uh, well, it was just, it was both good and bad, kind of, that I happened to be a woman because there wasn't a lot of women on Twitch in general. Um, in fact, when I started streaming, people were 
almost like well there was this rumors going around that it was actually my my roommate who happened to be a guy that was the brain behind my stream and i was like rented uh, <laughs> like a, a rented face or something in order to like you know he was the brain behind it all um there was like conspiracy theories about this in the beginning because it was that weird kind of um also, I'm not hold, a pro at all talk, the games. I want, I want to come <laughs> back to that whole topic of like online toxicity and what it is like for you as a woman and how that's changed over oh, yeah. time with the audience. So let, let's definitely bookmark that and come back to it pretty soon. But let, let's talk, let's, one thing I just wanted to- It was not really to toxicity you. back then. It was more like they were more stunned they, they were quite they were much nicer than they are now it was more like oh, wow <laughs> yeah well actually that's sort of what i'd love to get at is how has this changed over time because what you just mentioned one thing which is when you got started it was not mm. nearly as competitive as it is now there's far far more streamers which i think is mm. partly a reflection of how big the audience has grown over the last decade, but also that this is an income opportunity for a lot of people to play games and demonstrate yeah. how games are played. So let's let's spend time on that for a moment. How, how has the business of this and the whole environment for streaming changed over the course of time and, and, and kind of put some years to it so people understand where we're coming at this from? Oh, absolutely. So when I started, it was, I think in the end or yeah, end of 2013, beginning of 2014. So it was a long time ago. Um, Twitch had kind of uh, not so long ago become Twitch. And it was uh, before that, it was like just in TV where they tried to do this, um, mm -hmm. like kind of another, like they had another branding. They wanted to be streaming in general, but people didn't get the concept, I think, back then. So when they niched down and just focused on the games, that's when Twitch really started to take off. And, uh, and then I came along. <laughs> And uh, I've seen there's been so many changes to the platform during the years. Um, e even now, like, you know, things that has happened that you never thought would happen. And um, I mean, both good and bad. Uh, there's been a lot of different trends, obviously, in what kind of content has been streamed. Because when I started, you were only allowed to stream games and you had to have yourself in a little tiny like window. Um, the classical, like, mm -hmm. you know, let's play kind of um, and you were not allowed to do anything else you were not allowed to have a full screen or just have a, a conversation with the viewers um, more like a talk show or podcast so back then it was all games and then I think that changed um, maybe 2000 well 2015 or so I'm, I'm not really sure exactly on the been so many years now but it started it changed when uh, you could actually start doing other things and uh, i think i was also part of that change actually because how i got my stream to kind of uh well grow uh, and and what i did because you always want to try to find something unique and something that is uh, you right uh, i've seen people grow on twitch for all kinds of reasons whether they are you know dressing out and pretending to be a character or uh, they're coloring their hair pink, <laughs> you know, uh, that's just fun to see, I guess. So well, there's been so many things that can make a stream really go big. And for me, it was actually breaking the rules <laughs> of Twitch. <laughs> I broke that rule where you're only allowed to, um, to play games because I started doing digital art. Uh, and I tried to kind of shape it in the beginning to um, you know, I was like in a World of Warcraft uh, category and and play and try to draw a night elf and you know, I tried mm -hmm. to shape it like that, um, and I was kind of just hoping that I, they would be okay with it. I was sitting there kind of waiting like for the ban or something to show up, but it, ne it never happened. And mm -hmm. uh, I because I broke the rules, obviously people would love like they love to tell me that it was against the rules. So I got a lot of viewers just just for that <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I think a lot of people joined that are not at all they weren't interested in art um, there wasn't a creative uh, category so uh, they they were not interested at all and they joined maybe just to be kind of raging a little bit at first but then they realized that hmm this is quite interesting uh, you know because you see this uh, 
I do very detailed uh, cartoon-ish doodles, right? So you see this entire thing grow on the stream in front of their eyes, and they also could be part of it by coming up with ideas and you should draw this or try to do this, even if they're not artists, maybe themselves. They got to be in on the creative, uh, like a new experience. So uh, that is what really got me to to uh, to grow. And I, <laughs> I was worried to be banned, but then I saw that Twitch own staff was actually watching my stream. They were lurking in my stream. <laughs> In the viewers. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm just waiting for it. But it didn't happen. And this, I saw several. So I think they started like sitting and watching my stream like while working in the day. Uh, maybe they were in the beginning was like, okay, do we have to ban this? But then they were like, this is pretty nice. <laughs> and uh, and they also stayed. And so eventually what I did is I, I reached out to my partner manager since I was already a which partner by then and uh, so and we have the perk of being able to directly contact uh, Twitch especially when you well at least back then when you were so new you got to know everyone like I could go mm -hmm. out and grab a beer with the developers it was not the biggest company it was before Amazon also um, so um, yeah um, I, I, I basically reached out and I said that I know that uh, <clears throat> I, I've been breaking the rules you might have you know, noticed that he's like yeah <laughs> I noticed <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like yeah well uh, I mean if you want to uh, I can uh, I can just you know keep playing games on Twitch um, and I'll just move my art to YouTube <laughs> <laughs> that was a good way to put it yeah, yeah. Uh, so and like, you, did no an incredible, you did an incredible amount of product research for them <laughs> like they should have been super happy and grateful <laughs> like th the right thing to have done would have been like hey we've got to give her some equity in twitch or something well, it was probably already owned by amazon by then they, they should yeah they, probably <laughs> you should have gotten comp for that is what i'm saying because you helped them figure out what the product really should become and it's it's actually really interesting to look at entrepreneurship generally and like the number of times that the new product really was about breaking the rules in some fundamental way and hopefully in a good yeah. natured way which which you were doing and then building something around that so that's really interesting because i i think people hearing this are learning about what it is to be a live streamer but they're learning a little bit of entrepreneurship as well. Do you, what else do you want to kind of use your platform to do in the future? I, I know you've had a lot of ideas. Is there anything you'd oh. like to share? Um, well, I mean, in the beginning, it's a lot about, uh, well, having fun, of course. I just started playing games. But then when you realize it can be a job, that is actually, wow, this is a business. It can do something out of this. Uh, that's when I started like experimenting, trying to think out of the box and come up with new, um, uh, well, the creative section uh, actually they did start so i think it was a couple of months or something after i started uh, drawing they actually opened up the creative category and that was the first different category on twitch there wasn't mm -hmm. games so uh, and they i think they did that together with adobe or adobe mm -hmm. adobe i'm not sure how you see that but um so uh, and that was like a launch for so like that opened so many doors for so many people in all kind of creative fields right um, and I wanted to just continue on that. And I think uh, after like all these years, because now I've been doing this for so many years, and I know like I know this industry like like my own pocket kind of right. So <laughs> it's um, I, I I realized that it's one thing that I miss on Twitch in general uh, that I don't see a lot, and um, that is um, education. I think. I mean, mm. just learning things. So uh, I haven't seen a lot of people that actually use Twitch as a platform to teach others, uh, whether it's, um, I mean, it could be someone teaching someone else code, right? Like, or coding. Uh, now I've also, I've started seeing musicians that like write their songs and they also play their music live on stream. So that is like a little bit. So you can see it like kind of developing more and more and more, but there's not, I don't think there's even a category for it yet. Uh, so that is what I want to do, like, moving forward, I think. And uh, kind of using all this knowledge that I built in order to uh, teach other people to do the same thing, pretty much. Just 
you know, everything from thinking out of the box to how do you build a live stream or, well, it's not just a live stream because it's the entire social media, it's your entire reach and, and everything that goes in, uh, into it. Because um, you also see a lot of things developing that is not so positive, right? Mm. So I want to kind of work against that. Uh, and, and you also see a lot of rumors, a lot of, you know, people think uh, they see people write things in chat. They really don't know what they're talking about, for example, and they believe it. It could be either young, uh, young guys or girls, you know, they see the people that n they know it alls, right? And they mimic and, uh, you know, that kind of just that becomes like an avalanche, right? That just gets its own life and it starts trends that is not maybe the best trends um, or at least not in my opinion. So the, I want to work against that and like be using what I've learned for good to help other people. That's what I want to do. I, I think you were just returning really to this subject of, of online toxicity. So, I mean, let, let's talk about that for a bit. Like what, what should people know about this? Oh, wow. Well, I think uh, especially the last a year or or one and a half two they're starting to like show up more things about like toxicity and the toxicity around twitch and so on but before that twitch hasn't really been in focus or the gaming gaming in general i don't think has been a lot in focus it's been youtube right like the adpocalypse on youtube and uh some vlogger doing something they shouldn't then and before that it was blogs you know like people writing things um, and I think that it's kind of finally, in my opinion, catching up to the live streaming section. Um, because, uh, uh, I, I don't know, it feels like gaming has kind of been under the radar. Like, and it is still to some, to some degree, because just like it can be online everywhere, uh, people talk about the internet like it's, you know, um, it is the internet and then it is IRL, like real life which almost say that the internet is not real even though people spend many times like the majority of almost their lives their their you know their time on the internet it, so um, i think that created toxicity and also i think that you know no rules no boundaries really in from both in games many times and in social medias uh people just been going wild right especially on twitch uh twitch was it's probably the most toxic platform. Uh, it's getting better, but it's, it's, it has a long way to go. Um, because in the beginning, you could, like, there was no rules on how to regulate your chat. So people could just write all kinds of, like, racist or, like, homophobic. I mean, people could write anything. Just You could see these huge streamers with chat that was just, just falling, right? With um, every bad thing you can think of, pretty much. Um, and many of them started growing because they didn't m monitor it. Like they, they, they just let it be and they uh, were just playing games and they pretended it wasn't there and that was kind of their way of growing. So I think for guys, the toxicity can be, and I say guys because for women it's not really the same, but for guys it's kind of been like, uh, like a bro thing, like a cool thing, like, you know, uh, no, I like freedom of speech and no rules and, you know, uh, and that kind of took a life of its own, especially on Twitch. And Twitch, like I said, has gone under the radar. So people have been able to just do crazy stuff um, until until quite recently. So, yeah, um, that is hear a definitely lot of things. made it the worst. I, I hear a lot of things in what you're saying. So for one of the, the common mega trends that that i talk about in this video series is this idea of the online world is just as real as our physical world but not everyone has always thought of it that way like certainly 20 years ago it was unusual to think of it that way but these are real people and the relationships you form with people those are real you know these are real people's lives so it's all based mm -hmm. on reality yet people who are coming at it from games maybe they think as you were just saying that because they're anonymous and it's like just a game to them and they're sort of flexing their ability to express themselves any way they want they can just feel that it gives them license 
to do whatever. How is that, you said that it's changing though. How are you seeing it changing? Is that technology? Is that culture? Is that Twitch becoming more involved? Like what, all of the above? I'm, hmm. I'm just curious. Honestly, I think uh, there's, there's a couple of reasons. Well, first off, uh, probably like just bots becoming better at catching it, right? So uh, that's like mm. just the, the evolution so of, tech. of tech and AI. Yeah, but mm -hmm. mostly um, I think is that gaming has become so big in general. Like, the, the, like, well, we all know how huge the gaming industry has become. And, and other uh, companies finally start to open their eyes for that and being like, what happened? Like all those nerds, you know, like <laughs> all those nerds that <laughs> no one wants to hang out with. All of a sudden they're like the rulers <laughs> of the planet, kind of, you know, like we're, so they're <laughs> we were like, you know, like, like the turtle and the hare kind of. Um, and um, um, I, I was definitely part of that, the nerd group, by the way, <laughs> in school. Um, so, uh, and I think that has opened the eyes. And, and when people start to open the eyes of the, the revenue and the money and how big it is, it also started to um, be more clickbait and media started to highlight things. And, you know, things that happen in the industry in general, like, like what's happening with the Blizzard and, and Activision. Um, and, um, and then, you know, also social medias like Twitter during the elections and, and things like that. Um, that like is, is come closer and closer to that. And Twitch, I would say is a kind of recently starting to be in the limelight or like starting to be focused in media before people didn't even know what that was. Like, even though, uh, well, I, there was a lot of a big audience on Twitch, right? Um, the, the general public, the people that were not like hardcore gamers and, um, they, they really did not get it. Like. I even had to describe what streaming was, you know, like, um, so, um, now people started to realize it and, and become interested and, um, that is why it's changing, I think, because people have to be held accountable for, for what it's, uh, what it's doing, like the people's kids and whatnot. I think it has to come from a lot of different, like, this is like my, like, really, if I had one passion, right, it's, it's about mm -hmm. this, so. I think it has to come from a lot of areas. It's both like media. Media has to focus on it. People have to be aware of what's going on. Um, I also think the parents need to be part of their kid's life because, you know, like I I basically get the first like first row to seeing uh, the difference between the kids where the parents are a big part of their online life um, and the ones that don't. And, it's a big difference. Like you keep hearing about soccer moms and, and pageant moms and dads and, but you never hear Fortnite moms, right? Or Roblox moms, <laughs> even though they, they spend just as much time, if not more, you know, mm -hmm. in Fortnite and Roblox. Yeah, and I, think I, I consider myself to be a, a Roblox and Minecraft dad for sure, because I have kids, I have two yeah. 10 year olds and they're, they're both in, in those two games more than just about anything else. Well, I shouldn't call Roblox a game. It's a whole metaverse of its own, of different experiences. They're, they're in both of those yeah. all the time. And we have dinner conversations about it. We have this ritual in my family where when we're at dinner, we go around the table and I say like, okay, what was the best and worst thing of your day? And yeah. it's interesting because I learn a lot just even from something like that, like what kind of experiences they're having online. And I think my kids are learning about to like identify toxic behavior. I hope that's what they're, they're doing and, and then reject it actually. Like my son will say, well, the worst thing that I experienced last night actually was he ran into this toxic person who was using like racist language and stuff and uh, oh, yeah. the server rebelled against this guy and, and uh, threw him out. So I think that's good. So that, that's parental involvement though. What, what else would you want to tell to parents? Uh, wow, well, I mean, what you just said, I think is just amazing. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be just, you know, playing along with your kid, but it's just like kind of being a part, taking a part of that world and, and also uh, I think allowing it because when, uh, well, this is also maybe a difference between women and, and men, but and it's also getting so much better. But, you know, uh, boys has always been allowed to play games way more and it hasn't been such a bad thing. But when when girls did, that was like, uh, you know, shouldn't you be like playing with dolls or go out and 
you know, sit, not sit in front of the computer. I mean, I used to wake up five in the morning uh, so I could play before school, right? Before everyone else woke up. That's when I played for like three hours. Um, that was my my time on the, in the day, right? Um, because I couldn't talk about it in school. And now women uh, and girls are me so much more allowed in the space. Uh, it still has a long way to go, way to go, but it's getting so much better. And I'm so happy to just hear girls being able to talk about it. So I think for parents to kind of uh, um, highlight that or like to, 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 yeah, to like tell the kids that it's okay. I mean, you can get an amazing, I keep saying to all parents that I talk to, even a taxi driver, like just the other day that started talking about his kids and how much they play games and, you know, uh, they should do sports instead. <laughs> so, oh, and I, I basically, <laughs> I basically said that, well, I told them how big the industry was and I mm -hmm. told them like, how much uh, these like 16, 17, 18 year old esporters actually can make and and what a huge career they can have if they're interested in that field, whether, you know, like it can be developing or 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 like just all the metaverses that is popping up, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I think I opened his eyes. <laughs> yeah, you just hit on a really important topic, which is I really want people to appreciate all the new kinds of jobs that are being formed yeah. in the metaverse. So during the course of this conversation so far, we've hit on a few. So you're doing one of those jobs, which is being a live streamer, which is live performance, and you're doing it both in games as well as art and creative processes and bringing your community into that. There's esports where people actually play on professional teams and compete in tournaments and can get pretty significant um, payouts if, if they win at that but that's a that's another job like there's a, so many new forms of occupation that are born around this and I'm I'm really intrigued in particular by this whole collision between the creator economy people who are doing things like you are which is art plus performance and all the all the the meta so to speak the thing that surrounds game experiences but it's also creating something new as well like and, and i don't think we know completely yet even what form it will take because there may be artists like you doing volumetric live streaming in the future in 3d immersive space and people are like there with you and maybe <laughs> people are learning how to do art and you're seeing them work on there like there's so many things that we're going to be able to do with this in the future that i think is just mind-blowing um, but it's new. It's it's not just a just a little bit of an extension. It's it's going to be a whole new set of experiences. You mentioned exactly. music, and just as yeah. real as real IRL, right? Um, no, I think I I just I waiting for the day. I always say that you know whether I'm like thirty or eighty, I will always be streaming <laughs> or doing whatever it is you do there. I mean, I'm I'm hoping. I'm really hoping that you know technology has gone so far that when I'm eighty or something. I can still just put on a headset or something and then like become 20 and get wings or <laughs> so, like fly around in, in you know, um, that's what I'm hoping at least. So <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, and with the jobs, yeah, the jobs that will come with that. I mean, people already build worlds, right? Um, online, whether it's in games, like when they mod um, Grand Theft Auto, right? Uh, which is one of my my main games or mm -hmm. uh, Minecraft or Roblox um, and just mm -hmm. imagine what they will be able to do in the future and the jobs that they can have in like in that space in the future. So I think it's definitely something parents should um, yeah, just be aware of and, and uh, try to like it's a good thing, especially I think with all all the AIs and all the technology that is popping up, all the like traditional normal jobs will like just become less and less and less and I think more and more jobs will actually be in the metaverse and in in spaces like that so um and prepare kids for that I think um but still you know moving around still being healthy as I think it has to be balanced right so yeah <laughs> it's all about the balance uh, and the conversation talking about it um I think it's great what you said with the that you're talking to your son about like what's happening in games and that you're letting it be a real thing because I think many parents are just like uh, oh yeah it's, it, you know if someone would say I was someone said something mean to me they would be like what really who, who did that you know in school but if 
uh, if it was like in a game, they would be like, oh, oh, you mean the game. That's just a game, kind of. That would exactly. be how people and it was the kind same. of react to that in the past. Hmm. And uh, I think uh, there's even, uh, there's so much science now that even proves. So I read this, um, I read this uh, um, article where they'd done a test to see what areas in the brain lights up when someone is uh, basically saying or, or you're seeing something mean about you versus when you get physically hit and uh, the same mm. area lit up when yeah. when they just like saw it like emotional right versus the the physical and i think that that just speaks volumes right how important it is to kind of just uh, be nice be nice to people even online right um and that is uh, just as important as it is in i hate saying real life but i don't know meet space <laughs> you know like the, the yeah we need a better <laughs> word for for, uh, is, is is an okay word. It's it, it's a little bit neuromancer, William Gibson. <laughs> um, I I think of it as physical space versus virtual space. I don't like using the idea of real because I think no. online our which is all premised on our relationships and our self expression in this space is yeah. is what makes it real. I have a feeling that you know millennial and Gen Z parents are probably already approaching this a little bit differently than say like, so I'm Gen X and I yeah. was pretty weird. You know, you mentioned nerds ahead of time. I was like ultra nerd because I, you know, grew up as a teenager playing Dungeons and Dragons and computer programming when both of those on their own were, were super nerdy. Um, but then I met my future wife in an online game and we started a game studio. So we are like, kind of ahead of the curve in terms of the nerdiness and like the online world and the online world turning into real relationships. But I, I, I recognize that I was very rare for that, for my particular generation. But, you know, Gen Z in, in particular has actually grown up with all of this. You would think that the way they're experiencing it and the way they're going to, I mean, most of them haven't had children yet, but as they have children, yeah. they're going to really approach this differently because they saw this toxicity that you referred to and hopefully didn't like it, don't want their own kids to experience that. Yeah, yeah, that, and that's, I mean, I don't have kids, even though I work a lot with kids and I work with kids even before streaming, but I don't have my own, but I, I, uh, I'm the same, you know, I was, I think it was 1999 and I'm born 86. So 1999 in Sweden, that's when I got 100 uh, uh, in uh, downloads. So <laughs> we were a bit before, like, uh, it was very, very fast, obviously. And I, I was, I think, among the first people in Sweden. I was just lucky with where I lived. So I got out, out on the internet um, very early or like more like the internet as it is today, I guess. Um, and uh, so I, yeah, I've, like I know exactly how toxic it is, and and growing up with that, I'm like that is such a that's probably why it's such a big subject for me because like I would never want my kids to like now when you realize when you can see it with like mature eyes, right? Like you like uh oh no, I I always kind of joke and say that I'm very happy that I was not like that streaming live streaming and things like that did not exist when I was like 13 or 14, um, because I would probably do a lot of stupid things, um, especially back then, because, you know, back then parents did not, they, they didn't even know, like my mom was learning word, right? Um, but there wasn't live streaming. There was, there wasn't like that. I couldn't even send the, like the bad photos to people. Thank God. I could only be in a chat, like text chat and be like, hot girl 14 or something <laughs> but the, so uh, now it's a totally different uh, animal right um and that's why also people have to be more aware but also so much more opportunities like there are so many good things that comes with it so at the same time i, I keep telling people don't try to like go back in time because it's not going to work like trying to work kind of against technology to be like, we're going to become farmers again. We're not going to have internet. I mean, it's not, I don't think that's the solution. The solution is just to keep innovating and, and making what we have now better and more secure. And, um, and also just teaching people that, you know, the, the more people realize that the internet is 
real or you know they just stop thinking about it as so uh, then i think that will change and it's already like you said changing um i i was like i got like front row for <laughs> all of those people that uh, i like to call them like um, they had the ipad nannies right uh, when parents use the ipad instead of actually maybe parenting as much um because it's nice uh, but they had no idea what the kids were actually doing on the ipad right. i i got to see that so mm, yeah i'm happy it, to see it changing i i think that's basic media literacy right so yeah. people need to become literate in games and metaverse and twitch streaming and esports if that's what their kids are interested in because on the one hand i my personal feeling is trying to shut that all off probably mm. doesn't work. Like kids know how to kind of tap into it through some other means anyway. So given that, that your kids are most likely going to get involved in some of these things, if they want to, if they're interested in it, it's really important for parents to become literate around it. Yeah. And spend time with your kids and see what they do and, and get a feel for the experience and talk to them about it. I think the talking part is really important and, and ask them what kind of experiences they're having there and, and what kind of things they're doing, because it can be enormously creative. It can be expressive. It's a way to socially connect with people in a positive way, right? It doesn't have to yeah. be the toxic aspects that we were just talking a lot about. Like there's also real human connection being formed through all of these things and and that i think needs to be celebrated just understand what the whole spectrum of experience can look like and be talking to your kids and also educating your kids about you know how to confront some of that in the online worlds yeah exactly and talking and not i, I was talking and not blaming because i think it's easy also mm -hmm. for parents maybe if they if they get scared or something you know um to be angry at their kids right like why did you write back to that person uh, or um you know things like that and i think just uh, also especially with games and the internet be open-minded like if they're doing something maybe that they shouldn't i mean of course you should but i think don't make kids uh, afraid of it so that they don't want to tell you anything uh, that is the key, right? Because I that it was like that when I was a kid. But like I said, I didn't have the same the same tools that they have nowadays. But I didn't have that um, that I I couldn't feel that I could talk to my parents about things like that because uh, um, it was you know they would be angry. And I didn't want them to be right. angry at me. So it was more like trying to hide it than 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 actually. Right. And I think just trying to get around that and be, that's why people should be aware and, and be part of their kids. I try to play Fortnite, mm -hmm. even if you're really bad at it. I'm really bad at it. <laughs> like, wow. It's but fun. Uh, run around, build a, build a building. There's something you can do in Fortnite. Maybe, maybe you'll be, be the first person down, but uh, enjoy it. it yeah. Fun. And, and enjoy it. Just find out what your kids are interested in. Like my kids ended up trying Fortnite, not really getting into it. They were much more interested in games where they could be a little more creative. And then my kids are also into like more retro style games like Undertale and Terraria and things like that. So, you know, kids may surprise you in terms of what they're going to do. It might not all be Call of Duty or Fortnite, you know, running around killing yeah. each other. <laughs> and also be aware that there are so many good things coming out of it, like, you know, leadership skills. Uh, mm -hmm. learning how to work in a group and um you know just uh taking initiatives and and the create like you said the creative uh aspect of it i mean there's just so many great things that comes out of it uh mm -hmm. if you look at research i mean most of it is it's like the majority is like positive just uh of all everything that comes out they're, they're not so positive is i think the social media aspect and the how people treat each other so that is what we have to really work on. And also, can I, I think since we are, well, you're, you're talking to developers and others here, I think a big portion of that, an important part is to have rules and regular like boundaries and stuff in games, right? Because it all starts somewhere and it starts what they are um, many times allowed to do in a game. And, and there's, I mean, I've seen even on Twitch being a streamer for, for all these years, I've seen so many changes in, in gaming in general, like how people could do anything, like the, everything was allowed in the beginning. And uh, 
I, especially as a like, streamer that have a lot of, you know, you get stalkers, you get people trying to um, uh, stream snipe you and destroy every game you play. And I just, I couldn't do anything because, um, for example, playing World of Warcraft uh, when they released the classic, I couldn't, it took me four hours to walk uh, the same distance that would, it would usually take 10 minutes. It took me four hours because I had so many people killing me over and over and over again because they, they could see what I was doing on the stream, right? Um, and there, there is no... The yeah, yeah, but we're talking like extreme things. I mean, not just like some uh, hiking and killing, but like we were extreme. They they made guilds that was all like, they were named like Kill Sweebless. <laughs> and uh, and this was like just, I don't know, when was Classic released? That was not even a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and nothing was done to this. I, I tried, I spoke to Blizzard. I was like, is there something you can do? And they were like, well, we'll look into it. Nothing has ever happened. So I think, you know, just kind of putting your foot down and, and some things shouldn't be, I mean, it shouldn't be too strict, but it shouldn't be not crazy things like that. Um, like having entire right. groups with hundreds of people, like being all attacking someone that should not be allowed. Yeah, I mean, I think the message that I'm hearing is if you're a game developer with a live game and, and pretty much all games are going to be live games from now on, even single player games become live games because they have a whole community around the game that that's relevant there. And you have to be intentional yeah. about what you want that community to be. If you want it to be the wild, wild west, do nothing, and then you'll replicate exactly what you just described. If you want a different kind of community that has greater empathy, that's open and welcoming to all kinds of people of different backgrounds and life experiences and stories and whatnot, then you have to be intentional about it and it takes work. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know I've been talking with you before about like um, bots and uh, what you can do and, and uh, so I know it's also like the technical aspect of trying to develop that because it's just so much of it. Um, I mean, there's games Counter Strike. When I play Counter Strike, I mean, there is not a, a game that I can join without having people being like extremely toxic because it's mm -hmm. it's allowed. Uh, and I think as a streamer in general, whether you're you're male or female, or just online, it's like if you choose to be a streamer, then you're you're choosing to get hate. That's what people. That's how people see it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, but you know, if you don't want hate, you shouldn't. You shouldn't be a streamer. It's basically part of our, our job description. And that is one of those things I try to work against. And even even to kids, you know, I see this even uh, small kids on, on like TikTok and so on. They get really mean comments, right? From randoms and they don't remove them. They just, they let them just stay there on, on YouTube or, or in TikTok because it's like this kind of unwritten rule that you're not supposed to like remove it the really bad stuff. And I try to tell people that, you know what, your social media, that is your space. It's like your living room or, but you know, living room on in that, like your little living room in that app or whatever. So um, you decide what should be allowed there or not. And you would never allow someone to stand in your living room and, and tell you things like that. You would throw them out, right? Um, so I try to tell people to do that even, uh, even in social media. So it's, I think it's just something that is kind of rooted in in many and it's probably rooted in this whole like freedom of speech um thing which obviously is a great thing is really good and very important to have freedom of speech but i think freedom of speech should not be freedom of consequence right and then, yeah and not so and is... not free and not freedom to enter anyone's living room and expect that you can say whatever you want and not be asked to leave exactly exactly I mean, that's just common sense, I think. Exactly, um, yeah. People are treated as objects in the online world. That that hasn't fully caught up yet. We've talked a lot about this idea of virtual mainstreaming, meaning the virtual world, the metaverse, it's real, but there's a lot of people who approach it thinking, well, these are just people, like they approach a person like you as, hey, she is a live streamer and she can be an object of whatever kind of toxic nonsense I want to I want to send your way because as you put it that's your job you you're supposed to put up with that which is which is completely terrible like you'd never treat a person like that in real life unless you're like a psychopath 
No, no, exactly. I mean, they probably some of them are psychopaths. Uh, yeah. But um, far from everyone, I think it's just people have this idea that, uh, yeah, you're you be, like they, they. I don't think people understand exactly what it is to be like on the receiving end of that. When, especially not when there's hundreds of thousands, literally, um, that, that do it. Even though it is like, um, um, you know, anonymous people most of the time. Um, but I think, and that is also something that goes into streaming. I think right now, like if you want to be a streamer, uh, that is one aspect that is, um, it's just, you can't get it, you can't get away from it. So like, I see a lot of people stop streaming just because of that. They can't take it, especially women. Mm -hmm mostly women but um, mm -hmm. you know they can't take it um because it's just it becomes too much in the end um but again i'm hoping like that's what i'm fighting for i want that to be better because streaming can be an amazing thing and i think nowadays streaming is very important also for the gaming industry because i know so many people that go to twitch to like try to uh, you know see a game before they decide if they're gonna buy it or not whether it's twitch or, or youtube mm -hmm. but twitch is a little bit it's more uh, personal, right? Because you can, they can ask me questions. They can't ask a YouTuber questions. So, uh, but if they wonder something that I'm not telling them, they can just be writing it and be like, so what do you think about this? Or can you try this? Or uh, do they have this setting? Um, and then I'd be like, oh, let's, let's check it out. And then I, I can do that. So you get like this totally different, very personal connection with a streamer in a way that you don't really get um with uh, youtubers in the yes. same it, youtubers is more like when you watch something on tv so and that is also why i want more people to start streaming and and realizing it companies uh, after covid especially started to realize because twitch have been growing a lot of course because so many people be was home and and so many people lost their jobs and they tried to like get a career as a streamer uh, instead and mm -hmm. um yeah, so I, I think uh, more people to Twitch and more eyes on Twitch, like the more companies uh, and so on, the better I think the community will be too. Because just same as with games, right? People have to be held accountable. And that goes for the social medias too. They can't be like, well, we haven't done anything. What was like your platform? You can decide if you're going to have them in your living room or not, right? Um, and, uh, and what rules you're going to have there. So mm -hmm. that goes for all companies it, and when it goes to Twitch, especially gaming companies, right? Because if it weren't for all the amazing games, Twitch wouldn't be a thing either. So they are definitely depending on uh, on all of you guys. And, mm -hmm. and businesses generally, game game companies specifically, really are trying to figure out ways that they can tap into these authentic connections that you have formed with your community because your community trusts you it's what they call influencers and mm. i'm just curious like what have your experiences been like working with game companies what should game companies know about working with someone like you um well i mean uh, before before clubhouse i didn't actually know that many developers because as a streamer you kind of have this um a big wall behind you or like between you and the developers which i could never really get past and that is the the agencies right so the, the which i mean they're doing a great job too because that's also how you find jobs and they're making all of our jobs easier but personally i just love having direct contact with the, the company and the developers that makes it. Um, like one of those examples that uh, one of the companies that's done that is um, EA that did the uh, Game Changer program. So through mm -hmm. the Game Changer program, I could be um, like an Apex Game Changer and I got to fly to, um, to Los Angeles and actually meet the developers. Like, Mm -hmm. hang out and since i'm extremely interested in in design and i didn't like at that time i didn't have the chance to lead, meet a lot of people in the industry that was so exciting to just like i i was probably the nerdist i i zoomed in on a roof like and i was like how did you do that texture <laughs> so uh, i got so many questions because it was so much fun so personally um even though i know it takes time but try to also have 
uh, form like personal re relationships with streamers, uh, not just having like this the agencies in between. Right. The agencies. It seems can be like it should be obvious but... business sense because yeah, if you're, it's not like you're an advertising venue and they're just placing ad units. It, you have the connection with your community where they're looking for your knowledge and understanding and that interpretation really of what the game designers had in mind with the game, what's special about it. And you, you can be more like an ambassador than, yeah. you know, just someone who's talking up a game to, to get views or something. Exactly. And, I mean, and you see that a lot. You see these platforms showing up, right, that have hundreds and thousands of different streamers and then they just send it out to everyone like uh, I can just click a button and be like accept to get a, a sponsorship or, or something and then I'm supposed to play this game a certain day and, and for this many hours and um, and absolutely uh, that can be good for some aspects I mean if you want to reach like a, a big mass of like very small streamers in order to like kind of be raised up on the um, in the browsing on Twitch and so on. But I think it's more crucial to kind of just, yeah, create those close relationships too. Uh, because that's like, I, from a, from my perspective, that's just, it, it becomes a totally different thing when you talk to or about a company where you actually maybe met the people uh, or, or like, yeah, you've been speaking to them and you're like going, like getting to know them. And, and it becomes such a, like, the viewers can feel it, right? So they feel that it's like an authentic thing. It's not just, this is a blah, 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 you know, like it's very salesy and it doesn't become salesy because like, you're not just talking about this uh, thing to get, Passionate that gives you money. Yeah, yeah, it's like people behind it. Mm -hmm. And also show, uh, I think we want to see more, we want to see the developers, like not just like everyone, I'm talking about everyone. We want to like, I don't know, make TikToks do get a TikTok account and do goofy dances like some <laughs> developer that would never dance in his life get him to like try to do it like people will just eat that up they would love it right so it's I think it's also the company itself kind of just becoming um, like real people instead of just uh, yeah like just yay or or something that can like have a bad taste in in some people's mouth but it's like if you're not just a company if you're actually hey this is this person that's awesome and i've noticed that when i work with so many uh brands and I, my one of my brand main main companies that i work with right now is lg which is also like this huge company right everyone knows what lg is everyone has like mm -hmm. either a tv or something but they don't know anything who is like the people behind that right um so yeah. when uh, i did that like it was actually a guy from lg that he was total nerd just like me so when we we were putting this campaign together we actually started talking games i think for like three hours when we were supposed to have a meeting for like 45 minutes but we really hit it off and then he came over and uh, like i was live streaming when they came and put up the tv and he was like talking and my viewers were like wow you know like they were like it became a totally different thing because like, wow, this mm -hmm. is a person and he's so cool. And wow, he's really good at English. And uh, he had like, um, you know, it kind of like, yeah, he had like long hair and a, like ponytail and then he has like little uh, earrings with like skulls in them and stuff. And it's like, yeah. wow, this is so cool. <laughs> you know, they, they connected the company and they could see like a gamer, right? Like they didn't want to see this like a like the a super model perfect or guy in a suit or whatever they wanted to see someone they could yeah. relate to mm. and then that is something i recommend uh, all developers to do and yeah get a discord it becomes so depersonalized and it's important for people to remember that there's people working there they care about what they're doing you know they're engineers yeah. they're developers they are people that can form connections with the community as well. That's tremendous advice. Yeah. Emma, we're, we're coming up to the to the end of our time, but I, I want to thank you for being part of this because this was just so packed with information about culture, both the positives and the negatives, the, the life of a live streamer, how you've been able to build a career around this. You know, to, to kind of maybe wrap things up though, 
there's a lot of people that are going to watch this where they're thinking about becoming a live streamer or parents are watching it and their kids have said, hey, I'm, I want a Twitch streamer. I want to be a YouTuber. You've shared some advice already about like just pay attention, be sensitive to the communities and, and become literate in their media consumption. But for that person who wants to make a career at this, what advice, what guidance would you offer someone? Oh, I would say, well, to become a streamer today, uh, because it's just such a huge market and so many people are trying, I think um, people should put more focus on trying to come up with content instead of actual just uh, putting all their time into buying the most expensive gear and setting up like fancy overlays and the, the emotes and like mm. you see so many people that have all that but they have like no viewers right so they're sitting there and the, that is a little bit depressing um so mm. i think just work on like if they put that same time that they put into doing all that into just trying to figure out like what is it that i can kind of bring to the table what is it i can do that that to kind of put a personal spin on it, kind of like when I, uh, yeah, wrote the rules by doing art. Um, I mean, it can be a certain theme or just, uh, hey, if you like uh, role play, do, do, do an act or, I mean, it can be anything. Um, I think put the time on that because it doesn't matter. Like you can have the most amazing overlay and, and tech and cameras and all that. And um, that's not gonna make, give you any viewers, but, um, but but if you have amazing content, you can have a really shitty webcam, probably even shitty sound. And uh, people are going to be like, they're still going to be watching because it's like, wow, you know, like what either that is so weird. What the heck is that person doing? Or it's like, wow, this person is so good at it. Or is doing things in a way I haven't thought about or is teaching, like I said, like things that they want to learn. They're giving value. Right. Um, so that is that is like number one. And also, I mean, you. You should have good enough internet, uh, of course, uh, because you're going to upload. So it's the upload that is important, and and put more focus on the lighting than the the camera, because mm. you can have a you can make a kind of a, a very cheap uh, webcam look like <laughs> like a million bucks if you have great lighting. Um, yeah. So the lighting is so much more important. If you have an amazing camera but like really bad lighting, is not going to help anyway. So yeah. Uh, I invested in a couple of flood lamps in here. It's a, it's like a hundred bucks. It's the cheapest thing you can invest in if, if you want to not look terrible on the camera when you're yeah, when you're doing any video. Exactly. This exactly. has been so it's so good. This has been so awesome, Emma. That that's a great punchline on this. So you heard it here, everybody. This is a creator economy, right? Like that's what's yeah. exciting about the metaverse is this whole confluence of creativity from games, from performance, from making art. It's a whole new range of experiences that people are having here. And it's something new, but it's about creativity. And I'm excited about all the jobs being created, the opportunities, the businesses, and also just the, the unknown world that we're going into here where we're gonna discover all kinds of new things together. So by the way, we'll put down in the show notes a link to Emma's Twitch stream. Go check it out and, and get a sense of the art the game playing, all the stuff that, that Emma's doing there. And subscribe down below to the video here on this channel because I have a lot of fun talking to people like Emma who are bringing all these different perspectives in the business, culture, and technology of the metaverse. So Emma, thank you so much for being part of this today. Thank you so much for letting me be here. It was uh, it was really fun. I, wanted, <laughs> I could stay for hours, so thank you so much. Um, also, if anyone is interested to learn more about this, they can reach out to me because I also do consulting in this for like small companies and so on. But yeah, super fun to be here. Thank you so much, John. Excellent. Thank you, Emma.